broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CJCA and Center for Coordinated Assistance to State Staff Recruitment and Retention webinar. My name is Sharon Pett, and I am an independent consultant, and I'm also the project manager for the Staff Recruitment and Retention Training and Technical Assistance Program. I just want to start off by just thanking everyone for registering for today's webinar and taking the time out of your busy schedules to focus on this very important issue of workforce development um, and working ultimately to improve the condi conditions of confinement and most, more importantly, working to improve long-term outcomes for youth entrusted to our care. So Wendy Faulkner, who is the Assistant assist, Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, um, isn't able to join us today, but she too wanted to welcome everyone uh, and thank you all for participating on today's webinar. And as you know, today's webinar is going to be focused on uh, specific strategies uh, to promote and support staff wellness in our juvenile justice facilities. So for those of you who might be new to CJCA, uh, CJCA is a national not-for-profit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems. Uh, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, and program with the ultimate goal of improving uh, long-term outcomes for youth and families. TJCA represents the juvenile justice system CEOs or top leadership uh, in all 50 states, metropolitan counties throughout the United States. Next slide, please. So this program is made possible through funding from the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs, Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention, uh, most known to folks as OJDDP. So through this grant opportunity, the American Institutes for Research, which is AIR, CJCA, as well as the Georgetown University LaPorte School of Public Policy's Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, or CJJR, um, have partnered to form uh, CCAS, which again stands for Center for Coordinated Assistance to States. Next slide, please. So CCAS coordinates the delivery of training and technical assistance to states, communities, territories, and tribal units uh, looking to improve outcomes for at-risk youth and youth involved in the juvenile justice as well as the child welfare system. So the focus of the center really is to provide ongoing training and technical assistance uh, to achieve individual and organizational changes that support positive impact on the juvenile justice system. Next slide, please. So before I introduce the presenters on today's webinar, um, I want to mention that on today's call, we also have Jonah Shenham, who is helping with the technical aspects of this program uh, from the CJCA office in Braintree, uh, Massachusetts. So thank you, Jonah. A big uh, thank you uh, to Jonah for helping us today. Without him, this uh, webinar definitely would not be possible. So, okay. so here are our presenters today. Uh, we have Phyllis Becker, who is an independent consultant working with CJCA and CCAS on this project. And we also have Penny Sampson, who is also an independent consultant working with CJCA and CCAS on a, on a variety of projects. And as I mentioned, I'm Sharon Pett, uh, consultant and project manager for the staff um, recruitment and retention technical and training assistance program. Okay, and I just want to thank uh, presenters who have been you really put a great deal of work into the preparation for this webinar. So really, thank you, uh, Phyllis and Penny, for all of your work leading up to this point and for being here today to share your insights and wisdoms with the field uh, on this very important uh, topic of, of staff wellness. So, okay, at this point, I just want to ask Jonah, before we kind of delve into the meat of the webinar here, ask Jonah just to provide us with a, two, a few technical instructions um, to kind of get us through the, the, the next hour and a half here. Jonah? Thank you, Sharon. So just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we uh, move forward in the webinar. If you are dialing in on your phone today, you can enter your PIN number, which you can find in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, this might help alleviate uh, any potential audio issues that you might have during uh, the duration of the webinar. Um, so we do have a very packed schedule today. If you do have any questions, feel free to type them into your GoToWebinar control panel. There's a questions panel there, and we'll do our best to get to them at the close of our presentation. But uh, like I mentioned, we do have a very packed schedule, um, and we have a lot to cover. So uh, if we do have time for a Q&A, we will certainly uh, do that. But again, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in. And now I will pass it back over to Sharon to go over our objectives for today. 
Great. Thank you, Jonah. Okay, so let's just begin with reviewing some of uh, what we hope to accomplish on today's webinar here. Uh, first, we're going to just briefly review kind of what the research says regarding factors that influence uh, why staff leave or stay with a particular an organization. Uh, we're also going to be discussing the types of trauma, uh, how to recognize warning signs of trauma, and the many aspects that trauma has on an individual, that being you know, physical, emotional, and, and social impacts. Uh, and finally, our, our panelists uh, will be sharing specific strategies that can help support staff in, in maintaining uh, health and wellness. Next slide, please. So these stats are probably not a huge surprise to many of you, um, but what the research is telling us is that um, estimated turnover among direct care staff in juvenile justice facilities is between 20 and 25 percent uh, per year. And quite frankly, uh, for many jurisdictions, this figure is probably pretty low in my experience. Uh, many agencies I've worked with uh, have an upward of 40% turnover rate. So these figures are pretty low, but that's what the, the research literature is saying. That's at least the studies that are out there. Uh, studies have also estimated that excessive turnover can cost agencies between ten and twenty thousand dollars per adult correctional employee. Uh, other studies I've seen have um, estimated thirty-one thousand per each ex exiting employee. So again. Uh, I think in the juvenile justice world, these, these figures are probably pretty low, and we can estimate that they are probably much higher. Um, unfortunately, we don't have specific statistics on that because there aren't very many uh, specific uh, studies around juvenile justice and kind of workforce development issues. So, okay, great. Next slide, please. So we all know the significant impact that staff turnover has. Here are just a few here. Uh, listed, we know that staff departures increase the, the risk of incidents because departures often lead to a reduced staff to youth ratio. And those shortages diminish the therapeutic interactions with youth and ultimately youth outcomes. So we all know that much of the treatment, especially in the juvenile justice setting, uh, occurs in that daily, those daily interactions with youth, right? And so if a facility is operating with less than adequate staffing levels or a facility is using mostly temporary staff to cover vacancies, the therapeutic nature of the staff to use interaction is greatly weakened. So consequently, you know, high staff turnover, uh, turnover can jeopardize an agency's ability to achieve its mission and positively impact the lives of the, the youth that we serve. Uh, we also know that high staff turnover causes, um, you know, stress on staff. You know, frequently using mandatory overtime to cope with excessive turnover, turnover. to cover those vacancies or those posted positions, uh, promotes staff burnout, uh, which obviously increases the likelihood staff are going to leave. So high staff turnover causes our staff to be overworked, it decreases staff morale, it destabilizes daily operations, and can really be detrimental uh, to an agency's public uh, image, which in turn obviously will make it difficult to recruit staff in the future. And as we mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we see that, you know, there are, you know, it costs money. Staff turnover, turn, turnover certainly costs us money. Uh, and a lot of these costs come in the form of unanticipated expenses, such as overtime costs, um, workers' compensation claims, and legal fees that result from an increased uh, number of incidents. Uh, and these costs obviously are in addition to the resources that an agency invests in, in new employees, such as new employee orientation, uh, uniforms and background checks, to name a few. Next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know, um, the CJCA and its CCAS partners have published a staff recruitment, hiring, and retention toolkit earlier this year um, that really does have an abundance of information, a ton of resources uh, related to workforce development. So th this uh, resource is available on the CJCA.net website um, underneath the resources tab. So I really encourage everyone to explore really uh, um, this toolkit. It has a, a lot of information and great resources in it for you folks. Um, so here's a quote from the researcher and author Russo. Um, and I think this really summarizes some of the key factors to retaining staff. And among these really at the foundation is the agency and facility culture. So the idea here is that we have a culture that in which managers support their staff we have leaders that recognize the good work that the staff are doing, um, that we're supporting staff in their professional development goals, and then providing opportunities for them to achieve their goals. Um, and you know, the facilities and agencies promote and support staff wellness. So this last one, obviously, staff wellness is the focus of, of our work here today. Next slide, please. 
So here's what the research also tells us about the factors that contribute to staff departures. Um, we know that job satisfaction is a significant predictor of actual turnover and that most direct care staff are usually dissatisfied or most dissatisfied with the failure of management practices to align with the agency mission. So basically management behaviors are not uh, in sync with what the agency values are uh, and or expectations. So this may come as a surprise to folks, um, but I will tell you that uh, inadequate pay is actually not the main reason people leave. Um, it is among the top five in many of the studies that we've reviewed um, and the research you know, says that it is up there, um, but it certainly is not the primary um, reason why. Next slide, please. And so among the top reasons uh, staff leave an organization are the work is not interesting, uh, staff do not feel appreciated and supported, and the third one is that staff are not involved in decision making. So there, are, you know, there are many research studies that show when a staff member is satisfied with their work environment, their commitment to the organization, um, organization or agency increases, which in turn increases the likelihood that they're going to stay. So in addition, a strong organizational co commitment can uh, positively impact staff recruitment efforts um, because if staff are satisfied with their work, um, they are likely to tell their family and family members, uh, friends and family members about their positive work experience, so which hopefully uh, may lead to folks wanting to come work for your agency or facility. Next slide, please. Uh, so what the author um, and researcher Spinchcomb uh, is telling us here um, is instead of trying to reduce turnover, we need to flip that narrative uh, to really look at targeting the root causes. So we really, what we really want to do is increase the commitment to our agency and facility. Uh, we want to make uh, our agency or our facility a place that people want to come to work each day um, because they're part of a supportive team, um, because they're acknowledged and respected by leadership, um, because they know their peers and their managers genuinely care uh, about this work, that they believe in um, the agency's mission and they believe that the work uh, they are doing is valuable. So something for all of us to think about as we continue to explore these workforce development issues is that we're really working uh, to increase uh, or strengthen that organizational uh, commitment. Next slide, please. So just a quick review here. The biggest factor uh, influencing staff attention is uh, agency and facility culture. Uh, and so we really need to work at addressing job satisfaction. And part of that process includes creating a collaborative, caring, and stable work environment uh, that supports creativity and focuses on our healthy staff, uh, the health of our staff and the safety of our staff. Next slide, please. So I just want to mention this real quickly. We don't have a ton of time today at all to go into this, uh, but again, just make sure that you kind of check out the Staff Retention Toolkit um, on cbaca.net. Uh, to get additional information about these generational considerations. But I do want to mention uh, some of the research around this um, in terms of the millennials are those folks that are 24 to 39 roughly uh, right now, and Generation Z folks are uh, 23 and younger, so youngins. Uh, but the millennials, one thing I do want to point out, and the Generation uh, Z folks, um, they really do want to view their work as serving a bigger purpose. Uh, they want to know that they are using their skills and contributing in a meaningful way every day when they show up. So, of course, I mean, we're all unique in individuals, so these are not hard and fast rules, um, but certainly things for you to consider um, that how do we, what are some ways that we can promote um, or increase that organizational commitment um, by helping demonstrate to these folks that um, what they do, the day-to-day -day work, even the paperwork, um, but those day daily interactions with youth, um, that they do contribute to a bigger mission and a bigger purpose. Bye, please. So I just want to leave you with one last reminder, developing and retaining a healthy organization and workforce it does not happen overnight. Uh, so you as leaders and, and folks, um, you know, direct care staff really need to be patient and steady. Uh, changing culture is, is basically a journey with many ups and downs and twists and turns, as we all know. Um, but supporting staff and providing them with the tools necessary to be successful in their jobs and helping them attain a healthy lifestyle uh, with regard to work are really critical pieces to improving job satisfaction, which again, what we learned is that is ultimately directly tied to staff retention.
So I'm going to turn the floor over to now uh, to Penny uh, to really begin to dive into what we mean when we say staff wellness um, and how we can go about promoting balance um, in, in the workplace uh, for our staff. So Penny, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And so welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you are making the time and hopefully this will be helpful to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about things that affect our wellness. And as we're seeing over time, staff wellness is the key as far as longevity in our field and providing good services to kids. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about trauma and the effects, and I will be talking about the individual effects, and Phyllis is gonna be talking about the organizational effects, and sort of to the end of the presentation, we'll talk about strategies for you to, to stay healthy. And so look at definitions, um, prevalence rates that are interesting for people in our field, and that's for direct care workers and administrators, and then the impact symptoms, and um, how it affects our lives outside of work. We can go to the next slide. And so most people are familiar with the DSM. So if we look at this from a mental health perspective, the definition of a traumatic event, when you look at how it's explained, are things that we are dealing with in our field every single day. And we're witnessing events, we're hearing about events, and we're experiencing or having repeated exposure. So we really want to make this a focus for everyone that's in the field, that we are aware of it, we understand it, so you know the signs, and we can help each other when we notice that people are struggling. And so this is basically the definition, and we can go to the next slide. So what happens is we, we all have things that happen in our life, and um, things come up in traumatizing situations. And for the most part, generally, we are healthy, we're exercising, we're having a life outside of work that has balance. And sometimes we get to the point, though, where we cannot, our internal and external resources are not enough to help us to cope with what we're dealing with every day which is, would be normal. And so we're gonna talk about what are the signs of that and how do we prevent it. So if we go to the next slide, um, if we think about the symptoms that are, that are caused, um, listening to stories day after day about our kids and our families, and just understanding that this work does affect our relationships in our inner life and in our experiences with others and how we see the world is affected by our work. And I'll just give one small example. Sometimes when we're in our field and you walk into a restaurant and you see an older man with a younger child and they're having an ice cream, Norm most people that aren't in our field would say, that's so nice, a grandfather is having ice cream with his granddaughter, but we think, is that a child molester? And our minds and our brains are different. So I want to talk about that and how do we mitigate that and how do we stay healthy and positive and engaged in life while hearing time and time again very difficult stories of what happens to the kids that we that come to us for help because they're struggling. Next slide. And so we don't realize sometimes how much it's affecting us and how much it affects our physical body and our physical health. So we're going to talk a little bit about the fight, flight, and freeze and how that affects all of our um, systems in our body and, and what health issues can develop if we're not really careful and what we want to be aware of that can happen. So the next slide. And so there was a, a Amazing study. It, it was of 17,000 people, probably the largest study ever done. And so I want to talk about this for a minute. And it looked at the ACE study is looking at the general public. So if we go to the next slide, this is how people test it out in the general public. And then I'm going to compare it to people in our field. So if you see the high one in six have experienced trauma and kind of a history of the general public 
So the reason I wanted to talk about this for a minute is that this is our staff. So our staff are coming in, and generally these are the percentages of us in the community that have trauma in our lives. So they're coming in, they're working for us, and then they're being introduced to more trauma. So knowing that when we hire people, it's really recommended that if people come in the door, that you get to know them, that you have a safety plan with the staff and teach them about wellness and balance. And we never want to take this for granted because it's very serious and it can make our staff very unhealthy and it can make our work environment very unhealthy. So if we go to the next slide, if you look at, which I found to be very interesting, so people in our field, direct care staff or correctional officers, counselors, we kind of use those terms interchangeably and we're working more towards using more language around therapeutic language rather than correctional language. However, if you look at it, you know, our people in our field have more work-related violence than any other profession after police officers. So law enforcement, interestingly, understands this and they have a whole system so that they get help every time there's an incident and everyone is required to be part of it to mitigate some of that. And that's what I'm hoping that we're going to do in our field. And so a very high percentage of our staff have symptoms of moderate to severe PTSD. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to look at, you know, where does that come from? And most trainings or conferences that I go to and I ask people, have you witnessed an act of violence or aggression? Or have you had occasion where you've had to restrain a youth? The, the percentages are, are pretty high. So we know with people coming in, we know that it's an environment that exposes us to trauma. And so if we go to the next slide, and so one way when we look from a mental health perspective, what helps people to remain mentally healthy is when you feel you have control over your life. And so how do we make a trauma informed environment and individually and Phyllis is going to talk about how we do it organizationally within our facilities and so the more control and Sharon touched on it the more control that we feel we have as individuals that our staff feel the healthier that we can be and it absolutely mitigates stress so a trauma-informed environment and this sounds very simple um, but it's critical our schedule people come to work they know what's going to happen. They know what's happening next. And they generally know the activities of the day. And that they also, we want them to have a say in how we plan our days, how we plan our schedules for work that we do directly relating with the kids and also kind of administrative level work. And so in any mental health diagnosis, and I talk about that because we do meet the criteria for, for PTSD, many of us. And so when it gets to the point where you can no longer do your job or function properly, that's when we really have to ask for help. And sometimes our colleagues and coworkers are not going to realize when they're kind of slipping into this state. So we really need to keep an eye on each other. If you see someone struggling, pull the person aside, talk to them and go, go to um, your supervisors and, and look at what you can do differently to support that person before it gets to um, a very unhealthy or danger point. If we go to the next slide, these, we're gonna go over some warning signs um, of a, a trauma response. And so some of it is just hypervigilance, that you'll notice or you'll notice your staff having diminished creativity and joy when we don't have balance we lose a lot of that in our life and sometimes if it's if it's gone on and it's for too long you'll actually 
of dissociative episodes where you're at work and you're you're kind of working feeling like you're working outside of your body and so the next slide is going to talk about so vicarious trauma people talk about that a lot so we have trauma response and then we have vicarious trauma and burnout and they're used interchangeably and so when you feel like you have no time you have no energy you're feeling disconnected um social withdrawal sensitivity to violence nightmares despair hopelessness kind of all of these things will come in to play and they can be insidious and you don't see them and i can use myself as the example of having you know not done a good job with this which is why i'm so um, passionate about talking to people about it the social withdrawal I would not want to talk to anyone. I would pretend I was talking on the phone, walking to my car because I was emotionally drained and exhausted. And when I got home, I had no energy. So that is not how we want to live. It's not how we want our staff to live. And that's why we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to give you some solutions and some ways to avoid that. And so when we go into the next slide, um, we're going to talk, there's a couple of slides coming up that are going to talk about symptoms and um, kind of things that it doesn't feel very positive, but I don't want you to be discouraged because we are going to talk about how to mitigate this and how to have balance and some simple steps you can take. However, these are symptoms that you may have if you need more balance in your life and you need to have some more support. So depression, isolation. And, and I see this a lot working in the field for over 30 years. People just don't want to go to work anymore. They don't like it anymore. They feel overwhelmed. And so we, we want to go to work and be happy and excited because we know we're going to go. We're going to do good things. We're going to help kids and families and all of it. So some of the signs are you don't want to go to work every day. and You get there and you don't feel good about what you're doing. Um, disrupted personal relationships. And at the very end of the presentation, I'm going to give you some really interesting Harvard research that talks about how important this is, loneliness. And with, with trauma and burnout, concentration is affected and decision-making skills, it becomes harder to remember things. And so we want to notice if you're having or feeling any of these ways. And so if you go to the next slide, there's more symptoms to talk about when we are under chronic stress and you'll notice this in yourself and your colleagues you'll be sick all the time and we have illnesses around us all the time with the people that we work with and the environments they're closed sometimes there's no windows we can't get fresh air and generally you'll be okay with that if you're healthy but with chronic stress you're going to pick up those things colds and um respiratory infections pains and and a lot of the the pains and muscle spasms is is around you know feeling stress and not realizing that your whole body is tense and one interesting thing about our field is you know generally people when something happens that's traumatizing you can you know fight flight um but with us, we, we can't go anywhere. We have to not only stay in the situation, we have to remain calm and we have to remain in control, read and think properly, but that does take a toll. And so if you go to the next slide, you may have a few more of symptoms, which if you look at, and no one really wants to talk about these sort of things, but I'm going to, is that your body completely shuts down when you have a fight or flight response. And so your whole digestive system, nothing's really working. And so these are just some more signs that we need to take a look and we need to get some help and support to you or you need to get help and support to your staff. And then there's a last slide relating to this, which is next. And just what we want is for all of us we we do very hard work and i commend everyone on the call this is extremely hard and difficult work that we do and we want to also 
do this difficult work, change other people's lives, but we also want to be able to enjoy life and delight in the goodness around us and enjoy our life outside of work and be good partners, parents, or whatever it may be for our relationships outside of work. And so now we're going to pass it over to Phyllis. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for joining the website. Um, as Penny was saying, I'm going to look more at um, the larger system, uh, the organizational program system in terms of um, well-being and looking at well-being as a pathway to creating uh, a, an environment that um, mitigates some of those impacts of the, the trauma that Penny um, talked about. I've worked in um, juvenile justice for over 25 years and I started as a frontline staff and I was in leadership and administration. So a lot of the things that I bring to the table in terms of talking about this is based on my experience as well. Um, I'm going to, uh, next slide please. Um, so Penny did a wonderful job of talking about the effects of stress. So we know that work stress has a negative impact on our lives and our pro productivity um, in work. And again, if you add in the layer of the type of work we do and the stresses that brings to it, it kind of ups that work stress. So um, I'm going to talk about the connection between well-being, work culture, and how that impacts staff and stress in the system. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the bigger system level, when we're talking about indicators in terms of culture, these are some of the warning signs or indicators that the work culture might be, um, that, that is unhealthy and there's some things going on that will impact staff's well-being. So you might see a lot of blame, um, poor communication, um, gossip, the kind of toxic gossip that distracts you from the work, um, sabotage, um, boundary issues, either very uh, lack of boundaries or too rigid boundaries. It's not clear who's in charge and, and, and the system is clearly or the program is clearly um, um, drifted from their vision and their mission and their values. So those are indicators of unhealthy workplace. And we know that these are things that uh, uh, impact staff well-being in a negative way. Next slide. So when we're talking about the um, connection between trauma, well-being, and the workplace, we, we want to look at how our values and our culture create our norms and practices and how all these things impact staff well-being, including secondary trauma. Next slide. So what I'm proposing in terms of looking at a definition of well-being, it's, it's those set of needs and elements we need in our life and, and experience that will in the right combination and balance, help us to have resilience, hope, and health. And so to kind of further define it, we'll go to the next slide. And so these are some of the, these are the elements that we're looking at in terms of uh, well-being. So there are five of them that we're going to be looking at, social connection, stability, safety, mastery, and meaningful access to relevant resources. These are um, elements that, that are universally needed. Uh, we need it, our kids need it, our staff need it, everybody needs it. They're experienced individually and, not, and one is not more important than the other. So the next slides we're going to look at um, are going to kind of define these domains a little more in depth. So when we look at social connection, um, uh, which is a very universally needed element for everybody, we get a lot of those social connection needs met at work. Um, when we're talking about social connections, we're talking about the give and get, um, um, the diversity, um, um, the sense of belonging, a sense of a connection to a group. Um, and so in the workplace, for example, in terms of well-being, if there's like an in-group and an out-group, um, that might then impact 
people's um, well-being in terms of social connections. Next, we're going to talk about stability. And when we're looking at stability, that's about having a, our universal need to have a sense of predictability um, about our lives and our daily lives and what's going to happen next. It's those anchors in our lives that um, provide stability for us um, and, and the amount of assets and challenges we have in these domains impact how well we, we are meeting our needs and stability. So for example, in this, this domain, um, I have some assets in that domain um, in terms of if I had a family member get sick um, and I'm working, I have sick leave, I could take sick leave off and uh, not impact the stability of my life um, in terms of taking care of this very um, basic need to connect to my family. <clears throat> but if you think about some other people, so for example, some of the parents of the kids in our families, um, they may not, the kind of work they have, they may not have sick leave. And uh, if they had to take off extended time, then they might uh, get fired. And then if they get fired, they can't pay the rent and then uh, they might be evicted. So stability is about having enough assets in, the, in that domain that one small problem is not going to snowball or domino effect into another problem and not have a devastating domino effect. So that's what we're talking about with stability. Um, safety, um, again, safety is a huge issue and a need for all of us. So safety is about physical and emotional safety, it's about where we have safety in terms of people, um, places, and systems. And it's also a big piece of safety is, can I be who I am in my totality um, and be supported in that, in that without harm or humiliation? Next slide. And then mastery has to do with our potential and ability to feel like we can experience um, um, some in chargeness of our lives, our ability to influence our environment. I kind of like to define it as a high, those high five moments in our lives when we are like, hey, wow, I really accomplished that. We all have that need to experience mastery as part of our well-being. And um, in the workplace, mastery can be, you can get a lot of your mastery needs in work, or you could be very challenged in your workplace around mastery needs if you're not feeling that influence. Next slide, please. Um, and then the last domain is meaningful access to relevant resources. And so this is about, we all have a need to be able to connect in a meaningful way with fairly reasonable access to get the resources we need to create the lives we want to, to live and to actually build resources in the other domains. So um, um, the whole piece about meaningful access has to do with, you know, you might have a resource, but you can't get to it. So then that's not meaningful access. So in some urban areas, for example, um, you, there might be groceries, um, but they're not in your neighborhood, so you have to take five bus transfers to go get groceries. That's not meaningful access. So this is all about being able to connect to those resources we need um, to, to, to create well-being in our lives. So let's review some of the key points of well-being, and you can bring all those down. So we all have assets in the five domains of well-being. We all have challenges. We all are working to meet our needs in those domains. And sustaining them um, may mean a change of one day, domain and addressing trade-offs in another domain. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trade-offs because trade-offs become a very important concept when we're talking about well-being in the workplace. So you can go to the uh, next slide. So when we're talking about trade-offs, um, it's, it's sometimes we are put in the position of having to sacrifice something in one domain to um, get an asset in another domain. And sometimes that sacrifice is worth it, and sometimes it's not. So when we're looking at well-being, 
and we're looking at uh, people making decisions, sometimes those decisions are about how uh, is the trade-off, um, if I do this, is the trade-off gonna be worth it? So for example, if I was offered a job in another state um, and I was gonna get a huge increase in salary, that would add to my stability domain. However, um, that move in terms of a trade-off is it would impact my social connection domain because I'd have to leave my long-established friendships, my families, I might have ill parents, and uh, this would take me away from that support. So when I'm making that de decision, I have to decide is that trade-off worth it? Is making the more money uh, worth it over the social connection piece? And so those are the kind of things um, when we're talking about uh, the workplace, what are some of the trade-offs and things that are happening in the workplace where staff are put in positions that they have to make a choice between doing a good job or staying in a job or, or, or leaving? Um, and, and how can we, in the system, create and help people mitigate those trade-offs? So on the next slide, these are some typical decision and trade-off points for staff in the juvenile justice system. So, you know, I like my job, I love my job, um, but the shift work is really impacting my social connections or my stability in terms of how uh, I'm feeling in terms of my health, wealth, and being. Um, and so staff will make, have to make decisions about that. How, you know, is it worth it for me? How this shift work is impacting me in my personal life. Another real typical trade-off decision for staff in the juvenile justice system is, you know, uh, they you come to the work, you have a desire to help the, the youth, but um, we know the youth, we have bring in very, many comprehensive complex issues and they can be overwhelming. And so, you know, staff is trying to determine whether, you know, can I really make an impact with the overwhelming amount of challenges our youth bring with them into the system? Can I make a difference? Which gets back to that mastery domain I talked about earlier. If folks don't feel a sense of mastery on the work and Penny mentioned this early, earlier, then they, 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 the, their work satisfaction goes down. And then another trade-off is you, know, you love working for youth, but it's not like we're making the big bucks in our world. And so, you know, can I balance that out? Is the trade-off worth it? So those are the things to think about organizationally is how can we as a system help minimize these trade-offs or at least make them explicit and staff understand we know that those are issues. Next slide. So looking at well-being in the workplace. So you look at well-being on the individual level, you're looking at, you know, what are the assets, needs, and challenges in the domains of, of well-being for me as a person going into this workplace? Um, and where do I experience trade-offs and how do I deal with that in the workplace? At an organizational program level, again, is how do we support a positive and healthy program culture that supports staff and youth well-being builds, how can we help build assets in those five domains to make it a healthy work environment and a place where staff want to be? Um, and then we need to understand what, in terms of organizationally and in our program, what does stability mean? What does a stable program mean in our system? What does safety mean in our system? What does social connections mean? So we, um, for example, social connection for connecting with staff or we got staff connecting with youth, we have community connections, we got connections with kids' families. So defining that and understanding that. And then how can we identify trade-offs that occur for staff in the workplace and address them to optimally support their well-being? So getting to well-being is um, you, we have to look at and identify what, what are we doing in our organization or in our program that's holding the problems in place that might be creating unhealthy cultures and look at how can we shift to create an environment that holds solutions in place and leverages a healthy culture. So, um, and, and the other piece to get into well-being is we have to have, everybody in the system really needs to have a relentless focus on sustaining a healthy work culture. Um, it's not gonna happen by itself. We have to make that kind of culture happen. And then we have to look at the policy structures and practices and values 
the, do they align with and to support uh, well-being? And then remember the parallel process, which I'll talk about in a second. So next slide. So when we talk about what's holding the problem in place, when we're looking at organizations, practices in the triangle, practices, policies, and structure and culture, um, if we're not conscious and intentional about what we're doing there can hold problems in place. And then, you know, what are the stories we're telling ourselves um, that might be holding the problem in place? If, for example, we think that, uh, you, know, not, you know, this is a real simplistic one, but we think, you know, kids can't change. Well, we have that as our story and our narrative that's going to impact the culture, our policies, our structures, and our practice. Our kids can never be trusted then that's going to impact our culture of policy practices and that can begin to hold problems in place that might impact staff well-being and we also have to look at relationships and power and what's the history and how did we get to this place um, in our organization next slide so here are some examples of uh, things that uh, in organizations that can hold a problem in place you know, we'll see some structural um, disconnects. So in this example, you know, we have an expectation that staff are to log every shift. However, how we structured up our shifts is that it doesn't allow for time, time for staff to log or debrief between shifts. So that impacts well-being because that can create safety problems, that can create instability because the people are not talking to each other and staff might start feeling isolated and not connected to the bigger team. So that's an example of a structural disconnect. I got two examples of policy versus practice. So let's say you have a, there's a training policy that's new staff or to work with experienced staff for two weeks. However, the practice is that that never happens. The staff are often scheduled to work alone and um, are with other inexperienced staff and then you Again, it impacts safety for both youth and staff. So, and if safety is um, um, compromised for youth and staff, that impacts staff well-being as to workplace stress. There's other policy versus practice. A lot of times we have great guidelines or um, beliefs and philosophy, but um, they're not reflected in what we do every day. So this example just shows about, you know, we have some this organization B has some really detailed guidelines promoting diversity in the workplace. But in practice, their training materials, their videos don't reflect diversity. Hiring practices don't reach out to a diverse population. Offensive remarks about, you know, other types of religious beliefs are not addressed. And so that, again, then starts creating this unhealthy culture. It can feel disrespectful and create isolation in the workplace and staff well-being is impacted. And also the staff well-being is impacted. That means that the, the effects of secondary trauma um, are become uh, more able to happen um, or not dealt with in a way that's helpful to staff. And then cultural modeling. So when thinking about culture, if leadership doesn't model what they want in the culture, then um, um, we'll start seeing an impact of staff well-being. And then this example is a leadership not showing up for crisis situations. Next slide. So, so, what we're, so the goal is on the system levels to, to um, look at and go ahead and click. I think there's another. So instead of looking at what's holding the problems in place, let's create a system that holds solutions in place. And so to hold solutions in place, what, what we have to do is you have to refocus and reframe the organization to a well-being um, uh, orientation by if intentionally shift your practices, your policies, your structure and culture to align and hold those solutions in place. So uh, if you have a policy around well-being, then how, how does that look like in terms of our policy? Um, um, and, and if we have a policy, is that what's happening in practice? Um, are we creating structures that support a well-being approach um, that 
that support staff well-being. So those are, and are they all in alignment? So the next slide kind of looks at um, healthy culture and um, unhealthy culture a little more in depth and detail because in that leadership role you get you may have heard this saying before but you get what you focus on so you can go ahead and click um, and click again so when we're looking at um, the unhealthy culture on the right side what holds the problems in place if we have a lot of then fear blaming shaming disconnections you know, we're, those are the things, and if we don't, and we don't address that, or we're focused on that, then we're going to hold the problem in place. But the things that will, on the other side, looking at healthy culture, things that hold a solution is in place is that if we, especially in leadership, and really, we're all leaders, you know, it's, are we approaching things with clarity, courage, neutrality, compassion, connections, and safety? And, and I have to say, after working in juvenile justice for 25 years, we bring a lot of courage into our workplace. You know, the work we do is not easy, and the things we're trying to accomplish are not easy. And I, I so applaud, you know, that piece of our work, the courage it takes to do the work we do. Um, healthy culture, you, you want to provide context. You want to uh, normalize things so people understand that, yes, definitely, Yes, what you saw and heard is, is something that is very difficult and it's something we all need to kind of come around and make sure we're all okay. We need to kind of create a unifying piece and create change. We need to communicate thoughts, feelings, and needs versus shutting down. We need to have discussion and dialogue that results in possible and, and, and results in positive action versus kind of having the debating and arguments that can stall out actions. And then in everything we're doing, uh, especially if we're moving forward to having a relentless focus on healthy cultures, we have to work in, in, in all things around a solution-based focus. You know, how can I make this work for kids, family, staff, and the organization? And then have, create a shared understanding and encouragement, and then really appreciating um, success, uh, successes and um, the process of the work. Next slide, please. So um, when we're thinking about getting the well-being in the workplace, it's important to think systemically that and understand that what impacts one part of the system impacts the other part of the system. Um, so uh, if at the administrative level there's a lot of secrets, uh, you'll probably see a um, uh, uh, secrets in the staff team level and you'll probably see secrets in the and the group youth group level too so so all this modeling there's all this meta communication going on so that parallel process is about that and also works the other way if staff if um if in the system people are reacting and moving forward in this place of transparency that will be you'll see that at the leadership level the staff level and the kid group level so um that Systemic piece is a very helpful thing in terms of helping how to get people trying to put in solutions that you can keep held in place so you don't have that drip that can occur in our programs. Next slide. So this is just another way of looking at that and understanding that parallel process. And um, you know, then how you know how that how that is parallel and how it feeds on each other and how it impacts each other in terms of leaders, staff, youth, and youth, um, how they treat themselves and their peers. Okay, so that's, we're going to shift now and start to talk about strategies to support um, um, staff in a well-being place at the organizational level. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and then Penny's going to talk about it, what it looks like at the individual level. So next slide. So well-being at the uh, organizational level, when we're thinking about those domains, we have to, at that organizational level, we're, we're looking at how can we provide safety, emotional, physical, in the workplace? What are the strategies? the policies, the structures, and the practices we need to support. 
Um, and all these things, if done well and in alignment, will minimize secondary trauma. How, could, how do we create healthy workplace social connections? Um, how can we um, um, increase stability and anchors that provide predictability and pr pr prevent crisis? Um, how can we improve staff mastery so they can positively influence their environment and their relationships? And then how can we provide access to relevant resources that will enhance staff skills and performance? Because again, we know staff feel a sense of mastery in their work. They have more satisfaction. They're actually much more effective in, in creating change and creating healthy culture. And we know if we have healthy culture, we have, you know, we have a place where we have less incidents and things like that. So the next couple of slides we're going to look at um, just are some examples of well-being strategies that will build assets in the safety domain, stability, social connections, mastery, and meaningful access to resources. So one of the big things as, a, as an organization or a program is really reviewing your values, your practices, policies, and structures to see if they support a healthy culture that will increase well-being. Um, you want to invest in and build staff facilitation skills. And I'm talking about the, it's front, frontline staff as well. Um, build their facilitation skills to increase their mastery and how to effectively work with youth, youth groups, and families, um, which this can, the more effective and mastery there is, there's, uh, it will increase physical, emotional safety and stability. You want to utilize staff unique talents and attributes to enhance programming. And so if you have a staff who, uh, you know, is a good artist, uh, how can you, how can they, how can you support through your policies, your structures, um, and your culture, them using that in your program and let them bring those unique talents in there, which will increase their involvement and their sense of mastery in their workplace. Appropriate staff to student ratio increases safety and stability, allows work, allows staff to work as a team and meet PREA standards. Um, develop safety plans that outline for staff what to do in crisis situations. So having some, a lot of things like plans, like, well, if there's a crisis, who do I call first? And what do I do? Then what do I do next? And then what do I do? And if this happens, what do I do? Those are all things that create a sense of stability for staff. Um, in the workplace. And if you increase staff sense of stability and that they have the tools they need to respond to a crisis, um, uh, the more you're, you're supporting their well being. Next slide. Um, and one other thing I'd like to add to that in terms of the crisis piece, which isn't on the slide, I don't think, is that um, you want to create places for staff to be able to, to, to debrief and have a conversation and go through what happened and, and what didn't happen and all that after every critical incident. Um, because this is a place where staff and the adults in the system can come together and really help people deal with whatever, you know, tough things that happened to them, any trauma they might have had, an opportunity to have a safe place to talk about it. This is a place to increase mastery because you can talk about what what well and what did we do that went well to help de-escalate that crisis or manage that crisis after it happened, and then places for staff to talk about what do we need to do differently. So that's another way to increase staff well-being. You want to ensure, um, and that's during crisis, but you also want to ensure regular staff meetings that provides an opportunity, a safe place for staff to connect. Um, and this system, and, and this will increase the teamwork, it increases that social connection, increases safety and stability. And I know a lot of times we have a lot of staff shortages when we have crisis and it's hard. The first thing to go is the staff meeting because we're just in that urgent mode. But uh, I would say that as much as possible, keep those staff meetings going because this is the place where the adults can actually do planning um, around effective strategies to impact and have mastery in that workplace. Um, you want to create schedules. I think um, Penny or Sharon mentioned this, 
You want to create a staff schedule as much ahead of time as you can with staff input, because then that supports staff home life, um, that whole work-life harmony balance, and also starts minimizing some of the trade-offs of shift work and um, uh, that we have in our system. Um, staff um, should have meaningful access to leadership. Um, this supports healthy communication, positive connections, clear ex expectation of space to um, problem solve. And um, you want to increase staff um, and leadership support during program crisis to model teamwork, uh, increase safety and stability for staff and youth during difficult times. You want to surround staff and youth with people. Um, that's the thing that's going to create, create well-being more than surrounding them with hardware. That's only a tip. Those things are just temporary last resort fixes. Really um, bringing people around to support during those difficult times is the thing that get people through it um, with less traumatic impact. So now um, I'm going to pass this on to Penny, and she's going to talk about strategy, strategies to support self-care on an individual level. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. And we're just going to take a few minutes to talk about us as individuals and why is that important. Our work is extremely important, what we do, changing people's lives. We're dealing with people that have had extremely difficult lives and they need help and support they need redirection and they need to learn how to live and be healthy so if we are going to do that we have to model that so a lot of people in our field they have the biggest heart they're working around the clock they're doing everything they can and sometimes the only way to kind of reach in that to that and change that pattern of behavior because it's really not healthy and it's not going to help you is to think that everything you do for self-care is helping you be better at what you do. And so the first thing we have to do is be able to model healthy living. And if you, anyone has children or teenagers or staff or you work with people, no one really is going to do what you say. They're going to do what they see you doing. So as we kind of go through these couple of slides about ideas about how to live healthier lives, the reason is we have to practice what we preach. We cannot presume that we're going to help people to live healthy lives and, and do well in the community and have um, meaningful work and lives and then not do it ourselves. So this, this to me is really critical because I believe that everyone deserves to be happy and have a good life and we cannot help other people to have those lives if we are not doing that in our own lives. So a couple of things that we can do and you probably will know a lot of these. However, I'm going to remind you and maybe you'll get even one or two things that you can take from this webinar and make some changes in your day to day life. And so Professional connection and training are really key and supervisors and um, direct care staff go to your supervisors. It's critical that you're around other people that are in our profession. There really isn't a lot of people in the world that are going to understand what we do and we're a small percentage. So going to a social event or a family event what we're thinking about is not what everyone else is thinking about. And we want to have boundaries around that. That's, that's a good thing. But we also need people that we can talk to about the tragic day we had or the tragedy that happens, happened in a child's family, um, a, a serious injury that happened at work. All of those things, we do have to process them. And that's the difference between a traumatic event and PTSD is the ability to process, to talk about it, to be with people that understand our lives and what we're doing, and to get ideas from them and also share what you're learning about life and how to work in our field. And so self-care is critical and for each person, and if it's one thing that you can do today, what does self-care mean for you? For everyone, it's different. Schedule it in. 
on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, I know if it's not on my calendar and it's not, not on my to-do list, I'm not going to get to it. So schedule in times to do things that are healthy. Schedule in times to be with your family. And what that means for you, take a minute and really think about that and make sure you're doing that because not only are you going to be better at what you do, you're going to be a better partner, better parent, and whatever your roles are outside of work, as well as doing a better job at work. And so having balance is important. And kind of look at, you know, there's all kinds of balance wheels and different things, but are we looking at our mind, body, and spirit? And take a look at that in your life. And surround yourself with good people. And people that can listen, that are supportive. And, and one thing I do notice about people in our field is we're very good at listening. We're very good at problem solving. So then we leave work and we find people gravitate to us to talk to us about what's going on in their life. And, and you can help them. However, we need to, in our personal life, have people that can support us and that we can share our life with them we don't want to be problem solving in every component of our life. And so if we go to the next slide, um, routines and rituals are very important for a sense of control, but also routines and habits make us who we are and the type of person that we are. So having routines and rituals, there is a lot of research on thankfulness and being grateful. And even though it sounds, you know, I'm not going to meditate, if you can start your day in the morning, it can be at home or go into work and close your door and say, I have to take care of something for 15 minutes. Instead of walking in the door and solving a million problems while you're walking down the hall just to get to your office, take a few minutes to start your day and remind yourself that you're there because you're choosing to be there and you don't really have to be there. Sometimes we think we do, but we... We really don't. So take a minute to think of what you can be grateful for and make sure that you're having dates with your family members outside of work so that they know that they're important to you and so that you're um, having a healthy, balanced life. Rituals are so important and there were a lot of um, studies that Stanford University did around rituals at the end of the day. So we don't want to leave work, get in our car, continue to take calls, go home, and then talk about what happened at work. It's really recommended that you have rituals to end your day. For you, it may be you're clearing off your desk and you're making a brief list for the next morning. You're unplugging your phone. And a lot of us have our phones on 24-7. We're on vacation. We're at family events. We don't turn our phone off and we can tell ourselves that we have to do that because if we don't, who knows what's going to happen. So there's two reasons we want to do it. One is you want to develop leadership in your team. You want to pass the baton. Let people take over for you and allow them to grow. They're not going to do things exactly the way you would, but they're going to learn and it's, and have an atmosphere of letting people make mistakes, just like we do with the clients that we work with. So think of what your rituals can be, whether it's ending your day when you, a person, I was just at an OJJBP conference and one of the staff said they had a ritual to the end of the day. They would just slam the door before they walked in the house. And, um, and one of the family members said, you seem so angry. Why, why are you doing that? And the person said she was a social worker all day long. She just wanted to have an ending. So I think you can probably come up with a nicer ending than that. But think about rituals to end your day. And that also gives you a sense of control. And so if we go to the next slide. And surrounding yourself with people that make you laugh and that you can have fun. Laughter does so many things for stress and our immune system and all kinds of things. It allows endorphins and there's all kinds of amazing things that happen with laughter. And then if we go to 
last slide in this section. So how, so we want, and the whole purpose of this is to retain staff for us to remain in the field because we get all this experience and we want to be able to stay and share that. And we want our staff to be able to remain in the field for all of the reasons and how it affects us when we have staff turnover in such difficult ways. And so supervision is critical. If you are supervising staff, it's a key thing to make sure that if it's once a month, if it's twice a month, once a week, whatever you commit to, you need to keep that commitment to your staff. And supervision should be about looking at, are your staff healthy? How is their life outside of work? What are their short and long-term goals? And then they feel that you care about them and it's because you do care about them. If they want whatever they wanna go into or get more education, they can look forward to knowing that you're going to have that time with them. Sometimes we don't have supervisors that have the ability to do that for us, and it's understandable, but we need to find peers then so that we can talk to people about those sorts of things. So boundaries, critical again to look at when you leave work, you need to leave work, and not have that go into your life outside of work. Being a perfectionist um, is hard and it's something that you want to think about. If you're spending too much time trying to make everything perfect, we're, we're in a field we're dealing with human beings and things just are not, your day is not going to go the way your list started. And you need to say, that's normal. It would be abnormal if your day went the way you scheduled it. And for all of us in the field, we go in, we have all these things we're lining up to do, and then an incident happens, a news story breaks, um, staff is injured, and so all these things happen. So we have to embrace that life is ever-changing, and that is normal, and not expecting it to be perfect. The other thing I like to advise people in our field is to never say yes to anything. Always, when someone asks you if you want to do something, let me think about it. And you need to look at your schedule. Take a minute. We all want to say yes to everything. And because we're capable in so many areas, well, of course, I'll do that committee. Of course, I'll take this over. Well, that is going to backfire. And so you always want to take a minute and say, let me think about that. And let me get back to you. And make sure you're making the decision that keeps your life balanced and doesn't put you in a, a situation at work where you can never complete everything that you've been assigned to do or, or you've assigned yourself to do because that is unnecessary stress and anxiety. And make it home for dinner. It sounds really simple, but you know, make it home for dinner, have that time, have a boundary around that time with your family we are, we are working to live and to support our families and all of that. And so there's the balance. Do we live to work or work to live? We want to do a good job at work. So we have to take care of things that in our own personal life. And so we just have a few more things to go over. And I think Phyllis is going to take over. What are signs of well-being in an organization? Yes, thank you. So I'm going to just take a few minutes to talk about indicators of well-being, and some of these are things that have, uh, are reoccurring themes that we've uh, talked about um, through our time together. And you can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we know that uh, well-being supported, especially when we're going into a ju juvenile justice program, because this is where um, these are our kids' uh, temporary homes, um, is that you want to to see if, if it's a neat, clean, and organized environment. Um, we know that if that is going on in a program, that there's a certain level of folks respecting themselves and each other, um, which supports everybody's well-being in the system. Um, so that's one indicator to look at. We had, I talked earlier about the importance of staff meetings. So an indicator of staff well-being is 
that there are regularly planned staff meetings, they're well attended, and staff are engaged when they're in those meetings. That's an indicator that there's space in place for the adults um, and the system's giving room for adults to get together to do the necessary planning to have a successful program and successful delivery of services. Um, um, Penny just talked about the um, leader being available and accessible um, to staff. So that's another indicator. Are, is there, is there, do staff have access to the leader? Um, um, is there a, enough of an open door that staff can access leaders when they need to? And, um, and, is, and are they doing it also, not just when you need to in, in crisis, but also um, as a way to be proactive and planning. So are those regular leader staff meetings going on? That, that's a sign of well-being being supported in the uh, workplace. If you have well-being supported in the workplace, you'll see turnover decrease, decreases, you'll see critical incidents decrease because if you're having, if you're building assets and safety and stability and social connections and access to resource and mastery, you're going to see um, uh, the system um, uh, satisfied, happy people, um, and then you'll see status, you'll see happy kids because staff are really engaged in helping kids be successful. Um, staff successes are formally and informally recognized. That is also an indicator of well-being at an organizational level. Um, we talked about schedules. Schedules posted ahead of time is an indicator that we're looking at and trying to plan our uh, staff lives and, and them having input into that so they can have that work-life harmony. Next slide. Um, scheduling um, is done in a way that maximizes staff talents and experience. So uh, we're being very intentional and conscientious about how who's on shifts together. Uh, how you can maximize your most experienced staff with your less experienced staff, how you can match people up in terms of abilities and talents. Um, you can match people up in terms of teaching, coaching. So staff schedules are really intentional in those things. So well-being, uh, the well-being can be supported on every given shift that's going on. Um, another sign of well-being being supported is staff can know and can reflect the values of the organization. We talked about how important values are in terms of culture. And um, I just went through an exercise today where the question was, um, you know, we had to name what the organizational values were. We all kind of struggled with it. So, you know, how well do staff know what our mission and vision and values are. So that's another sign of well-being. Training requirements are met. Staff are being equipped to do the jobs um, that they need that they need to do and are given the skills and understanding of how to you know work on those shifts and that those training requirements are met um, in a timely manner. Um, and uh, as a result uh, the other piece of that is if youth programming is consistently achieved, we know that staff are working together to create that happening and that so well-being is being supported. And, and, and when we're supporting the well-being of staff, that impacts the whole system. And so um, and to help staff be more effective staff and, and meet the goals that we're trying to meet on a day-to-day -day basis with our young people. And so we should begin to see um, youth outcomes improve in terms of their education treatment goals, law-abiding rates. Um, um, you know, we will start seeing clear communication, including expectations. We'll see the laughter happening in the workplace that Penny talked about, and we'll see people. We know well-being is supported because the value of you know, it's it, leaving work on time and coming to work on time is a value. So people aren't staying over. And, and getting burnt out or coming in early, too early, and, and not giving themselves the time to have their home time and their work time is their work time. So um, now Penny's going to talk uh, more about individual indicators. Okay, so the good news is that you are out of balance. Every day is a new day. So these are just some. Um, 
find to take a look at, and this is something that you can take home to your family, your friends, and, and just look or privately with yourself, there's a few areas that are going to let you know how balanced you are. Your physical health, your emotional well-being, spiritual health, whatever that is for you. How is your sleep? And this is something that is one of the early warning signs of trauma is that you're not able to sleep. And so think about that. If you're not sleeping, it means that it's time to really talk to someone. And that's a critical thing to pay attention to. Exercise, play, enjoy. So this isn't, again, it's insidious. You can be working hard day in and day out and, and making a difference and changing people's lives. But if, if you're not in balance in any of these areas, it's time to get some help from friends or, um, you know, people outside of work or even therapy sometimes. I, I think all of us should be in therapy of some sort with the kind of work that we do. It's just so difficult. So these are the areas you want to keep an eye on. And then there's a study that I want to talk about just for a minute, you know, kind of to wrap up my section. And then Harvard did an incredible study that's going into its 80th year. And it started in the 30s. And it's on its fourth director looking at what is really the root of happiness? What is really helps us to be well. And so the study was so clear, and Sharon kind of touched on it a bit about why we do the work we do, but in this almost 80 year study, it was not wealth that made people happy. It wasn't fame. It wasn't working harder and harder and um, trying to get everything done every day. It was about positive, healthy relationships and connections. So if we know that, how important relationships are to keep us healthy, then we need to make time for those relationships. We want people in our life and we want them to be there when we stop working, when we do re retire someday, which hopefully we all will get to do at some point. But the healthy relationships, it's not necessarily um, a marriage because if you have a toxic home life, that is not, that's going to have um, an opposite effect. So it's, it can be friends, it can be people that are important, that make you feel good about yourself, that understand you. That's what keeps us healthy and happy in the research because they did medical studies along with emotional studies with people. And people that had strong, healthy, positive relationships were happier, they were physically healthier. Their mental acuity was better. If they had pain or illnesses, it was lessened. And it was clearly directly an effect of the types of relationships. If people had positive, healthy connections and relationships. So another reason why it is going to be a critical thing for us to pay close attention to that for all of those reasons, to stay in balance and to stay healthy for ourselves and so that we can also do good work with the kids that we work with. And so Phyllis found some really nice quotes, so I'm going to pass this over to her, something to think about as we wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, these were some quotes that we that really resonated with me about our topic today. And on that first quote, quote, when people go to work, they shouldn't have to leave their hearts at home. It makes me think of the, you know, safety domain and, and, and about part of what our job is in terms of creating a, a, a healthy environment is that people should be able to come in and not have to leave their hearts at home when they do their work. Um, and and we also know that if we don't pay attention to that, what can happen to us is we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, that the second quote about management and um, and understanding and 
and supporting the whole person, not just the employee, that, that these folks are more, were more productive or more satisfied. And if we're satisfied, satisfied employees, that means satisfied clients. Um, that one really relates to the parallel process we talked about earlier. Um, and, you know, the third quote kind of really gets to the importance of our mission and um, our vision and that um, if staff really believe in what they're doing and we create a system and, and deal with our policies and our structures um, and our practices to support that mission, um, you know, and staff are energized around that, you're going to have a, a, a workplace that is healthy and a place that people want to come to work every day. And then uh, lastly, I just really love this quote is that, you know, our work is about people and all the joys, the stress, the challenges and high five moments that can happen when working with people. And so some days just showing up is the bravest thing we could do. So thank you guys. And um, um, thanks for joining our, our webinar. I'm gonna pass it on to Sharon who's gonna close this out. Great, thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, um, Penny. Appreciate all the information that you've shared with us. Uh, we do have basically three more minutes or so. Um, so we've had a few questions come in. Obviously, we won't be able to answer all of them, but I do want to take a moment at least to answer one um, that came in early on in, in the uh, program. And so the, the, actually two of them kind of related. So there's questions around basically, um, and this would be for Penny or um, you know Phyllis, um, and I certainly can, can start off and answer a little bit. Um, but it talks about basically what is the process um, in terms of if a, if a site breaks out, um, should, is it a good idea to have a separate place in the facility or outside of the facility where we can go to have that staff member cool down? Um, and, and the other pieces around, the other question is related to that about debriefing. And so really quickly, I'll just say that basically when I worked through the, in the facilities for years, um, one of the things that we had in a couple of the facilities I worked at was a mandatory. If a site broke out, um, we handled the incident, we, we got it all under control. Uh, the staff members that were involved on that unit uh, were immediately uh, placed, replaced, quote unquote, um, kind of tagged out, if you will, is what we called it, tagging out. So we would have either it was administrative staff come in and supervise, help supervise the unit for a period of time, whether it be an hour, maybe a half hour, maybe two hours, whatever it may be. So administrative and the leaders would come in and, and, and you know, kind of give those people a reprieve and or when those folks came back, typically we would actually put those staff members on a different unit to work the remainder of the shift. So to give them a break, a different scenario. Um, and so, uh, but Penny and Phyllis, do you have anything as it relates to that? You know, when uh, I worked with um, Missouri Division of Youth Services and we would, when we have a, a critical incident, we really, we have a policy of, you know, within 24 hours that we, create a space for that debriefing to happen. And, um, um, and it's, it's usually some, it can be in the program, but it's separate, it's in a conference room or someplace else. Um, and, you know, um, and, and in addition, if there's certain, you know, if staff have been working a long time or it's been a real tough situation, we really try to create um, support for them and relief for them um, to to take a break and um, get away for a moment if it's been that it's if it, it requires that um, and to help you know keep the team fresh and and present during that that critical incident and the aftermath of it great Anything else, Penny, before we wrap up? Um, you want to yeah, add to that? Very quickly, I, I love that question and if we plan ahead, it's going to go a lot better. I've worked, you know, 35 years in facilities and we've had major incidents and restraints and, you know, really horrific things happen as it does happen. And then people would just go home. Or the other thing that would happen was people were more terrified about how much trouble they were going to be in. If there was restraint, was the resident injured? Am I on camera? And so we have to look at all of the things that we're dealing with in our profession now. And so having a positive um, support ahead of time, and it can be your facility directors, it can be your clinical staff, it can be anyone, but whenever there's an incident, you want to bring the people in 
in a positive way, supporting and thanking them for handling a very difficult situation and having that space to do that. So we are out of time, but that was a great question. Great, thank you. And so just to close real quickly, I'll do it in 30 seconds or less. Um, just next slide, please. Uh, here are just some resources um, that I mentioned earlier, CJCA Net, uh, underneath the resources tab, has this uh, toolkit that you may be interested, as well as a number of other uh, websites on there you might want to peruse uh, in your leisure time. Uh, and so just to wrap up, basically, just want to thank again the panelists, uh, the presenters today, Penny and Phyllis, did an outstanding job, really. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time out to you know, both uh, produce this webinar as well as actually conduct it. So appreciate that. Um, and just for folks to be aware of that a PowerPoint presentation, the PowerPoint that we presented today, will be made available on the coming days. It's going to be sent to all of you who registered for the webinar and participated. So you can expect that um, coming forward through your email. And if you have any questions on the last slide there, if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me with anything. I apologize that we did not get to um, all the questions, but if you have any specific questions that you'd like me to kind of funnel on or message on to uh, Phyllis or Penny, feel free to email me. Uh, my email there is at the bottom, um, or any other questions that relate to this topic or others. So I appreciate it. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, have a great day.